Welcome to Grow My Grit, a new podcast celebrating grit. My name is Peter Willis, coming in from Calgary, Alberta, together with our gritty guru, Hazelon Shetmeyer, who's beaming in from Mississauga, Ontario. Here on the Grow My Grit podcast, our intention is to engage with guests and listeners who are ready to know, grow, and show their grit. Perhaps best described as one's default settings in the face of obstacles, and what obstacles we faced since the beginning of 2020. However, one of the biggest opportunities for 2021 is the possibility of recreating our identities and re-engaging our relationship to both ourselves and to one another using the unique strengths we already possess and reliably bring to challenging situations. With our individual grit compass as our guide, let's explore what's available on the other side of obstacles. Are you ready? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hi, Hayes. How are you doing today? I feel excellent. How are you, Peter? I am doing wonderfully as well. It's great to see you again. So good to see you too. We have some new faces on our screen. Can you uh, can you do some introductions for us? I sure can. My wonderful friend Kim is here with us today. And what kind of sparked Kim's visit is really the discussion of grit and the idea of people of a couple people of a lot have said to me, you know, is this like an adult thing? Or, you know, what are the age groups? What's your target audience? And in having a variety of conversations, the the theme has really come up that grit is this universal opportunity because as humans, we are all experiencing and navigating difficult situations and really trying to figure out who we are in the face of that. And Kim has an incredible background and a lot of experience speaking and supporting youth in this capacity. So it Totally made sense to bring her here on to the Grow My Grit podcast. Kim, tell us all about you. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. I am a high school teacher from the greater Toronto area, um, and I've been teaching actually for um, 21 years now. Yes, it's a long time. Um, And so I've been working with youth for a very long time. And probably about eight years ago, I got a mental health class started at my school. Um, And Hayes and I have talked a lot about that. And seeing that element of students is really exciting for me as well. So wonderful. Thank you for coming. And just again, having this conversation, we did not pre-plan anything. We've just had a series of kind of short chats about, you know, what would this look like? What could this be? And in talking to Peter, as I do every week, it just seemed like a great fit. I'm just wondering, Kim, can you let me know a little bit about what a mental health class is? It sounds amazing. And uh, uh, I know at our school here in Calgary, there's a big focus on on a growth mindset and there's a real kind of uh, push towards uh, t- uh, towards that idea. And obviously under the lens, not that everything has to be under the lens of what's going on right now, but it certainly amplifies a lot of things. And a mental health class sounds super interesting. Uh, can you tell a little bit about it? Because that's new to me. Yes. So um, in Ontario, we do have an Ontario curriculum, which would be different in other provinces, but um, it is a course that's in the curriculum. The official name is um, Human Dynamics, but in my school, we refer to it as the mental health class. Um, And it's a focus on relationships, um, but it also has a mental health component. And I wanted to get it started at my school even eight years ago because I noticed more students struggling with mental health. I've struggled with depression, anxiety at times. Times I think everybody has, um, and I felt it was important, like you said, to talk about mental health um, with students and to offer them opportunities to talk about their own experiences and to learn. Um, and you're right as well. For right now, it's even more important than ever to have a course like this and to talk about mental health. It's such a it's such an interesting um, to me. Just while we're on the topic of of your human dynamics course, there there's such a there's such a an interesting kind of situation we're in where um, the people that are growing up, like the really young ones in grades one, two, three, and four, like the, the, the young ones, they don't have a benchmark yet. This is their benchmark. And we don't have a playbook for this, right? Whereas the, and I'm not saying that it's easier for older o- o- older students at all, because I, ser- I, I absolutely wouldn't know if it would be, but they at least have a comparative. Whereas with the really young kids, they don't have a comparative right now. This is their normal. This is their, this is their real, right? And uh, that's, um, I, I, I wouldn't, I don't know how to navigate that, to be honest. I mean, there, there's a great <laughs> segue into grit because that is, uh, that's a really, really unique situation, I think. 
you know, to, to be in a, to be a young kid and, and having this as your normal. I have a friend who has a grade, um, a little girl in grade, uh, grade one. And heartbreakingly, I heard her say it. She said, um, uh, she's been uh, kind of homeschooled by, by default naturally since the beginning of this about a year and a half ago. And she said to her dad, she's like, daddy, I don't have any friends. And it's because she doesn't go to school right now because she isn't able to. And she didn't go to preschool because she wasn't able to. And we're not allowed to get together and function a- in groups with these little kids, right? So not that the whole conversation has to be about that, but it's so interesting because that's her normal, right? And uh, what a great reason to be talking about grit, I-, I think, anyway, you know? And what I immediately thought of when I heard you talk, Peter, and heard you kind of support that talk, Kim, was the idea that it's one thing to have the sensation that you have no friends because you haven't been to school. But for the older students, I haven't had access. So those friends who were vital and crucial and a fundamental part of my experience, I no longer have access to those. So my first thought is kind of, I'd love to hear from you, Kim, on that obstacle, because equally important, they're definitely challenging situations for children and youth. But I just, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that piece where my friends who were the story of my life are no longer, or a fundamental piece, my access to them, their participation in activities, that's gone. So how do you hear about that in your experiences? What I've noticed since COVID is um, students realizing that social media is a great way to connect, but that it is not maybe the way that they thought they were wanted to connect. They're really missing, like you said, Peter, that in-person contact um, and realizing how important it is, even though they still have access to social media, um, they miss hugging, they miss seeing each other at school, they miss being able to go to someone else's desk and talk. Um, And so that in-person contact is really something I feel that they're valuing more now than in the past. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what I'm also wondering is that idea too, that how do we support children and teens and youth? So knowing again that your expertise or your passion, absolute passion and compassion is for your students, how are you supporting their element and their efforts to really learn about and access their grit in the face of this unimaginable but sustained difficult situation? It's been difficult, for sure. Um, Right now in Ontario, we're moving back to online again instead of in person. Um, And what I try to do in the online space is still create a safe space, create a a space where there's still routine, there's still ways to connect to each other, still ways to have their their voices heard, um, and to really validate what they're experiencing and have an open space to let them speak about what they're experiencing. So Mm -hmm. the way I did this for me personally was at the beginning of every online class and at the end of every online class, I always left space for questions, concerns, comments. Um, And they knew that in those times, that's what we did and anything they wanted to express, they could. Um, I use the chat a lot in the classes and I make sure to use their names a lot You know, I would say like, oh, Hayes, I can see you commented. What a good comment. Or thanks for joining us today, Peter. It's really nice to, you know, see you or hear you on the screen. Just to make them feel as included as I can, even though we're digital. Yeah, so important, so valuable. And I'd love to play on this again, knowing that our focus is grit, really getting to your attraction to the term because again I know you've been doing this for eight years as you said so you've seen a lot of ways to approach challenging situations and I'm sure there are lots of perspectives that I've kind of implemented that match things you've already done so I just love to hear what were your initial thoughts on the idea of knowing growing and showing your grit for your students and your thoughts and your reaction well I did do some uh, reflection on what I would notice in my students in terms of um, like a G and R and I and a T word so what I've noticed for G is that I said growth mindset for the students so at that age they are physically growing um, their brains are changing uh, and especially now as Peter mentioned with everything that's going on um, they've had to grow in ways that maybe they never thought they would have to grow emotionally mentally things like that um, but I find that they're very open 
at that age to growing and to learning new things. And I especially notice in the mental health class, the students that um, are attracted to that course, they are ready to learn about mental health. They want to learn, they want to know what's going on. And what I find interesting is sometimes I've gotten a little pushback from um, maybe people higher up than myself in terms of what we talk about in the mental health class. So maybe other people feel uncomfortable, but the students do not feel uncomfortable. The students are ready to have that growth mindset and just so ready to learn um, and share about their own mental health. So having that, um, that's what I picked as the, the G for them, that growth mindset. Awesome. And Peter, I love that relevance because I know in Calgary, the students, like the younger ones, have growth mindset as part of the curriculum too. Any thoughts on I love the observation that, uh, I mean, there's a couple things, but, uh, but the, the first thing that I love is I love the, the observation that the, that it's the older, the, uh, older generation or it's, uh, there's, there's a group of people that are kind of controlling the curriculum or in control of things, but the kids are the ones that are like, get out of my way. I want to learn. I want to do this. Right. And it's, it's, uh, our generation perhaps that's kind of like trying to, you know, uh, put put up walls, or you know, it's a little dramatic, perhaps. But I love the I, I love the idea that the kids are like, well, let's do this. Like, stand to the side if you're not with me because I want to learn, and that's cool. Like, I love that idea, and that's really um, that's interesting as well. As we get older, like I always think, like right now with a with a young girl trying to figure out when do I tell her this, when do I tell her this, when she ready to talk about this, and it's just like the kids are ready, right? We're maybe not, but they are. And that's so important to like recognize and get on board with fast, I think. So good. Tell us about your R for the students in your classes. For the R, what I decided was um, reflective. So again, um, I think all teenagers are very, 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 very reflective. (laughs) Um, And what I find is in the mental health class, especially, they are so, so ready to do countless journals. If I ask them to do a journal, it's pages long. Um, You know, if you ask them to share something on the chat, they just want to let everything out and share. Um, And I'm often even surprised, I don't know if you find this, Peter, with your daughter, but um, how much they share sometimes and just how open they are and sometimes I even think like wow that was very personal um but they're just so reflective and so willing to share um but it's also great because then in that sharing in the mental health class they feel like they're not as alone so if somebody shares you know that they have anxiety other people in the class have also experienced that and then they get that support and that validation Um, or talking even about um, you know depression or talking about um, other more serious topics as well where they realize oh somebody else has that too or somebody else knows somebody where that happened Um, and I think that that reflectiveness is really something that's so valuable So important. And again, just tying it to the bigger grit piece, I find that reflection is essentially the nature of the model. It's, you know, looking at what is your default setting is my question in the face of obstacles. What is your default setting? And you've essentially elaborated and expanded on that with specific ways of getting people to think about that information. So reflection is the broader term for identifying what it is that you typically do when things are tough, because you can't do that without reflecting. So I'm, I just love that that segue and the overlap is absolutely there. Tell us about your I for curriculum for your students. Yes. So the I I picked um, was individuality. So especially in this teenage age group, um, I think it's difficult because they're all individuals, but then you have this pressure of maybe fitting in, but still being individual at the same time and trying to figure out who they are at um, in high school as well. Um, One thing that I've started to do maybe in the past um, maybe two or three years is especially trying to foster more of that individuality. Um, Even in now, I notice so many more students are um, expressing different, you know, genders that they are um, resonating with. And so, you know, creating that safe space where they can kind of see who they are and express who they are. 
And the other students are always so accepting. And again, going back to before, it's the older generation, you know, in the school system that is maybe uncomfortable with that, but it's not the students. The students are very accepting if somebody discloses something um, about their gender identity, they want to know more, they're interested, they're respectful. It's not a big deal. Um, And so individuality is that exploring who they are, um, but also realizing that, you know, it is a very exploratory time when you're a teenager and you don't have to figure it out. I tell them, you know, you don't figure it out now. Now is just the time where everything is happening. Um, so they're finding themselves at this time and deciding who they, who they want to be. My mind is blown because the overlap, again, you're literally reinforcing the idea of individuality because at the end of the day, what I'm often proposing is that grit is that default construct that we all do, but mine is entirely different than Peter's, which is probably different than yours in that element of we are all managing through difficult situations, but we're all taking different approaches. So I appreciate that. And I'm just seeing it and hearing it now, that back and forth, that the construct of grit is a larger event, but what I need may be entirely different than what you need, but we can all be in it together. So I, that's the first kind of takeaway I just received. So thank you for that. How's it going there, bearded guy? Um, so I'll, I guess this is, who knows how this is going to, going to land, but you know, so when you were talking about, uh, before you're talking about your, uh, for R for the kids was, uh, reflective, right? Mm-hmm. And so I was, I was just thinking, um, that, that Hayes had this really, really interesting, um, uh, twist, I'd say, on on um, uh, on things. A couple of a uh, couple of chats ago, where she was being, a, a, she was a mirror to either myself or to other people that come and talk to her. Right. So when you actually said reflective instead of uh, reflection or reflecting, I was like, reflective to me was the mirror statement. So the kids are so accepting and everything because they're reflecting each other. They're seeing each other in each other uh, kind of thing. And I just thought that was really, that was really interesting because I'd never thought of that until Hayes brought it up a few chats ago that, you know, the answers are in you all, this was her talking, the answers are in you. I'm just reflecting you back to yourself kind of thing. I'll probably mess that up, but that was the gist of it. And I just think when you were saying, um, reflective as your R word for these kids. And that's what I thought of, you know, they're, they're so accepting and they're so, um, uh, they're so good to each other. They're just reflecting each other back. And then you get into that I piece, which is the individuality, um, which is interesting too. Cause I mean, I just think of how, how crazy it is when you're in high school and trying to fit in and all the changes and everything. And, uh, I just, for me in my head that's spinning around is this piece of uh, reflection that could either be reflection as in you're thinking and reflecting inside, but you're also reflecting outside, right? And you're showing support, you're showing people, uh, you can also, you can show people who they are, you're showing people a little bit about who you are, and it's coming at you from all these crazy angles, right? And hence there's individuality there because you're going to look different in every single mirror. Right. And I just think that was, there's just a visual there that I really like. And those two words to me uh, just play together and I liked it. So that's really all I have to say about that. (laughs) No, I love that Peter. Um, And going along with that, I find that especially in the mental health class, I do try to reflect in that way. Like I'm open to share that I've had anxiety that, you know, I've been depressed um, and saying, you know, hopefully being a role model to students and saying, you know, that happened to me too. And, and, you know, I asked for help and I got help and um, I'm very open with my students that I see a therapist. And what's been so interesting to me is I was a little nervous at first and then so many of the students, oh, I do too and I do too and that's great and I want to and um, kind of breaking down the stigma, you know, by being that mirror is amazing. Yeah, I, I think just to follow up with that there, Kim, my, my, for, for grit, for me, my, uh, my eye is uh, intimate. And one of the things that I talk about that is when, you're, when we're intimate, exactly what you're saying here is what it really does, I think, in a lot of situations that are uncertain or there's some apprehension, it removes, it deflates the situation immediately. When you're being intimate and you're like, you know what, I've, I've actually been there and I've, here's my example or whatever. And all of a sudden, all, all the knives are put away or all the guns 
guns are put down, right? And everyone's just like, it deflates the situation. And now all of a sudden we can move forward because we're, we're, uh, uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're mirroring, we're listening to people. We're, uh, in, in my case, for my eye, it's being intimate. And all of a sudden you can, you can start having these real conversations, right? Cause they're, you're not coming from a perspective of, um, a hierarchy. You're actually on level. It doesn't matter the age group, your level at that point, right? Mm-hmm. Neat. Yeah. yeah. The power of connection is essentially what we're getting at. The essence of safety and relationships and experience ties back to connections and safety is really what I'm hearing a lot of it. And just by being who we are and identifying where we've been is often the most meaningful show of, of solidarity and connection. Oh, so exciting and so so refreshing. And I'm so happy for all of your students. Tell us about your tea. What would you offer your students? Uh, the tea that I chose was uh, transformation for them, um, in part because, as we know, grade nine to grade 12 is just so transformational for them in so many ways. Um, but what I find to in the mental health class is it makes me so happy to see when during that the course of the class um, that you see some kind of transformation, whether it's um, even just learning, you know, about anxiety, that it's it's not just something that is your fault, that there's a brain connection, you know, depression, there's a brain connection um, and learning about that. Um, transformation by seeing that other people are going through the same things and that you do have that community. Um, also transformation, I do a, le- a big lesson. This, this is one of my favorites and the students love it too, even like on creating boundaries. And students always say to me, that lesson changed my life. You know, I can say to a friend, this is a boundary for me. Or I can say even to a parent, you know, this is, I need my space or I need this or I need that. And that's a big part of mental health is, is realizing what you need and then learning how to ask for what you need. And a lot of, I hope, a lot of the skills that they get in this class will lead to transformation. Um, and even just learning about mental health and talking about mental health hopefully is very transformative. Um, I also know that a lot of students in the class want to become therapists, psychologists, psychiatrists, nurses, doctors, and um, then they will move forward to transform hopefully other people's lives as well. Big, big impact. I just, I haven't stopped nodding my head. <laughs> I like the idea, if I can jump in there, Kim, the, um, you're talking about boundaries and it's interesting, the context that you're talking about it is what we've talked about a lot of previously, and this is maybe a, a different one, but it's for maybe a, I'm not sure, maybe it's for an, a, a more adult set of problems, but it's for people that haven't done this and that, that what we've talked about is the introduction of constraints to help direct your focus and to help guide you. And a conversation, although maybe we're not talking about with the kids right now, we're not talking about the introduction of constraints, but we are talking about boundaries. And I just think as a stepping stone to what's maybe going to help later is, you know, the introduction of constraints in terms of uh, focus and uh, the ability to pursue things uh, clearly, you know, uh, constraints can really be a a help and not a hindrance. Uh, And a conversation about boundaries at an early age, uh, Although this is a different context for sure, but it's still we're still we're still setting some um, some sidelines, I guess, uh, which is important to get them comfortable with that concept. I just thought that was uh, that was interesting. I know it's a, a sidebar for constraints on a, from an adult perspective, but I just think the dialogue about boundaries in general is it's so healthy. Yeah, everybody can benefit from clear boundaries. <laughs> Yeah, and they're so hard to set. They're so hard to set. Uh, And as you get older, if you don't have the practice, it's so hard, right? It really is to go as an adult to start creating them when you've got 30 years of of, uh, quote-unquote baggage with you and you're trying to now develop boundaries with people that you've known for 30 years. That gets really hard. So if you're... (laughs) If you, if you start at a young age getting comfortable with that concept, I, I just think, wow, how helpful that's going to be for these kids when they're a little bit older, right? I hope so. And I hope it empowers them because a lot of times as teenagers, you're in this weird age where you want to have more control and power over your life. 
but you're also in a place where you can't and it's impossible because <laughs> you, you know, you live at home and you need your parents still in so many ways. And there's that conflict. Um, but setting boundaries and learning that you actually can, first of all, that it's okay to, and this is how you go about it in a, in a positive way, um, is so valuable and hopefully empowers them even though there's, um, especially as you mentioned, Peter, like with COVID, you know, people's control over things is just, it's not existent anymore. Um, but they can still have maybe a little bit of, of empowerment or control as best they can. And learning to, to talk about it, or at least to, uh, to express themselves clearly about it. Yeah. That's just really important. Just the language around that. Right. Um, and sometimes, as you said, like in a family situation, it's not always possible to to honor absolutely everything. There's all kinds of situations, but at least uh, at least kids are getting, you know, maybe starting to learn to that they can express themselves uh, safely, right? And their wishes may not be completely granted, but at least they're getting practice, right? And I think that's that's so important. Yeah. Speaking about language, I also do some assertiveness speaking in the class. Um, and it's assertive speaking. It's not aggressive speaking. Um, and it blows their mind because I even give them a template of, you know, this is how you would ask for something. And uh, I love, love, love when they come back to me and say, Miss, I used that technique and it worked. And, you know, <laughs> they're able to, you know, get something or do something in not a rude way, but an assertive way. You know, this is what I need. And this is what I would like. Um, and I love when they come back and they tell me it actually worked. And what I love about what essentially just transpired is the messaging that as we continue to navigate obstacles, as we continue to be in situations that are beyond our control, one of the most important obstacles is considering what boundaries will be available to us and what we'd like. Because what I'm really hearing is that Boundaries exist to communicate to others, but also to make space for yourself. So building on that, Peter talking about boundaries as constraints, Kim talking about boundaries as barriers, at the end of the day, when you have appropriate boundaries, they make space for you to continue to be you. So I love that just hearing Peter talk as though your comment wasn't related. I feel like it totally is because boundaries and constraints at the end of the day are identifying where the environment needs to stop and where the environment stops is officially space for you. So I feel like another episode is really that idea. Asking for boundaries is okay when you value what that allows for you. So I, for example, I have no problem asking for things because I understand what creating that space makes available to me. So part of the conversations I have with people is that value added piece where each yes is a no and every no is a yes. So if I say no because of this and the other, I've now said yes to making time for myself. But ultimately, just wanted to really bring that home that we've essentially talked about a curriculums for supporting youth really as they manage ongoing obstacles, because that's really the story of our lives and looking at the ways in which transformation and change and boundaries and just, just creating space and identifying what we need, where we need it, and when we need it can in itself be an obstacle. <laughs> that makes space for managing other obstacles. So thank you so much. That was so fantastic. Peter, any closing thoughts? Yeah, sure. I just think it sounds, uh, it sounds like there's some really lucky kids to have you on their side. Thank yeah, you. That's, that's uh, the kind of class that uh, <laughs> a lot of adults could deal with too, I'm sure, right? And I mean that uh, like laughing and in jest, but it's actually pretty serious, right? There's, yeah. there's so much discussion. And it just like you said at the very beginning, there's an older generation that isn't used to some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And if we've got all these, these young guys coming up that are, that are ready to go, then we got to get on board, right? And I just think it sounds fantastic. And it sounds like you got a lot of lucky kids to have you in the room. Yes. Thank you. Oh, so good. And what would you say in terms of advice or suggestions for grown-ups listening, for youth listening? In terms of a mental health perspective, one thing that is so important and, and easier to do is to um, educate yourself. So there are a lot of great websites, great books, great podcasts. Um, and I, I'm a big believer that the more you learn about something, um, the more you break stigma and the more um, you may be willing to explore and talk about it. And so learning about mental health, you may find some things that are going on with yourself and then always reach out for help. 
Thank you so much for joining us and for blowing our minds. I just, I love looking at Peter stroking his beard and I just haven't stopped smiling because (laughs) there's just so much thought and just so much goodness and love coming from you. So grateful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. It was really nice speaking with you. You too. Thanks everybody. And we'll talk to you again soon. Grow My Grit with your hosts, Hayes Shetmeyer and Peter Willis, is a production of Gritty Guru Company. Technical production by Niall Fines. Music by Peter Willis. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcast, Google, and Spotify. For more information about Hayes' book, Know, Grow, and Show Your Grit, Self-Discovery Made Simple, please visit growmygrit.com. Niall, my computer fan decided to start blowing halfway through. I don't even know I had a fan, so good luck. I don't know what just happened. <laughs>